I think a good date is where you lose nothing. You, mm, you like show up as yourself and you leave as yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But you haven't lost anything. That's a phenomenal space to be in. You get to show up as you. You're leaving with you. Damn. Yeah. A bad date takes. Mm-hmm. Or a, an overly charismatic or an overly narcissistic person. Ooh. They take. Mm-hmm. And you feel less than. Mm-hmm. So if you're leaving a date feeling less than, chances are that's not a space that's going to be beneficial for you to operate in. We're welcoming back Julie and Lauren, and for this episode, we're going to put our therapist hat on, and we're going to talk hats, talk more about dating through our lens, working with clients mm-hmm. through, you know, the use of self-disclosure. And so now we really, you know, what is the therapeutic piece, and how are we helping our clients? And I think it's really interesting. I think there is this trend and movement towards humanizing the therapist a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I know when I was. You know, in school or training, it was really this idea that you don't use self-disclosure so often and that we're more of this blank slate, which I think we're evolving past that. I think there's still, for me, for me, too, for me, it's like there's still this resistance of like, is, can I say more about myself here? And it's really interesting to, I, I'm sure you both have this experience to sit across from a client that is going through something similar or you've been through and it's this moment of like, do I share and how do, how do I use that? And I think we're taught to use self-disclosure so delicately and thoughtfully, Mm -hmm. but how are we identifying those moments where it really helps? So how do you, how do you find yourselves, you know, when you're sitting across from a client that you really relate to? The question that I ask is like, do I want to self-disclose because I want to feel better in session or because I want them to feel better? Mm -hmm. And if it's me, I lock it down. Because because it can be uncomfortable. You bring up things that are triggering or that you share like experiences and you so desperately want to be like, I'm here, I'm with you, we've been through this. Mm-hmm. But then you, I have to constantly ask like, all right, is this selfish? Am I doing it because I just want to make myself feel less uncomfortable like sitting in these feelings? But if it comes back to them and I think it's going to help, I'm very mindful to leave all of the details out, <laughs> like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all of the major details. Basically reshape it as like, I had this experience and I'm very mindful to leave ages out mm-hmm. because I don't want them to track it as like, okay, if I'm at that age. Right, the mm-hmm. comparison piece, mm-hmm. yeah. Right, so I'm always really mindful to leave ages out, but it can be super like rewarding when you have someone who says, oh, thank God, yes, like, yeah. whew, this is normalized. I chose in one session, and for me, I've worked with, a, and, and both of you, you have worked quite a while, but for me, like mm-hmm. some four plus years, so I think I feel a little more comfortable using mm-hmm. self-disclosure because that relationship is really, you know, there's a strong foundation. And I had a session uh, where I shared something, I self-disclosed, and it was really rewarding because, you know, a day or so later, she sent me an email and said how helpful mm-hmm. it was oh. and for me to share that. So that felt really nice. And I think that when done well, it can really add to the therapeutic relationship. Totally. I'm kind of similarly. I use it very rarely, but if I ever do, very carefully, and I make sure I feel very clear and confident on how sharing this information about myself will benefit the client. So I don't think any of my clients know that I'm single right now. I haven't shared that with anyone just because again, like what we've been talking about, like we're all on our own timelines and journeys. So Lauren, Mm -hmm. like you're mindful to not share ages just so we can like compare that less. But I have a lot of women in 20s, 30s who are single, kind of like at a very similar phase of life. And I just feel like I validate the shit out of them. Like, I'm like, yes, I totally get it. I hear you. Yep. Like, I just feel like I can empathize so much, Mm -hmm. so much better. It's hard to fight that urge to to, do that, to say, I get it. I really, really get it. I don't want to tell you how much I get it, but being really mindful of why, what's our intention and what it's going to do. Is it going to help? Is it going to help our clients? I thought I watched, and Julie, I know you, well, we, read, uh, duh, we read the book for book club, yeah, yeah, Phil yeah. Stutz, The Tools, and Jonah Hill does a documentary, essentially trying to framework it as one session, but mm-hmm. sort of halfway through, they disclose that they've been filming this for a year. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting to display, really, again, this another lens on humanizing mm-hmm. the therapist. Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting to think about our previous episode that we just did where you guys, you've you've humanized yourself. Mm -hmm. Some clients might Mm -hmm. hear that. And how do you you feel about that? 
I mean, the Stutz documentary was incredible. Like Jonah Hill's relationship with his therapist, Phil Stutz, was it like, I was like, wow, like Mm -hmm. I've never seen or kind of like watched anything like that before. And they both had similar trauma histories. They both Mm -hmm. lost siblings. And I feel like, you know, as humans, we connect through shared experiences. Mm -hmm. Like, and we're used to that as therapists, like sharing and kind of the relationships being reciprocal. But as we know, like there's no no relationship like the therapeutic relationship so we definitely connect with our clients in other ways like just Mm -hmm. being consistent and reliable Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like witnessing their healing but like we were saying earlier I think when self-disclosure is done appropriately it looks like the relationship that Stutz and Jonah had yeah Yeah. I found that fascinating I think at one point they were saying that they loved each other yeah 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 Yeah. and they were talking about Phil Stutz's death because Mm -hmm. he has Parkinson's disease and he's a little bit older and Jonah was just saying how difficult that will be for him. Like my jaw was on the ground. I was like, I know. we're all young. Like we haven't had those conversations yet, but I'm like, wow, like I can't imagine what that must be like. Mm-hmm. Well, there's this immense, I, at least I feel this immense responsibility to our clients and even sort of some, you know, I had that come up when I was going out on maternity leave. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be out for three months. And you're like de- dehumanizing myself almost mm-hmm. and that like I don't have a right to this time because my clients need me and so that was a really interesting disclosure in that in that documentary that there's this real fear to lose your therapist yeah and I'm sure like with certain milestones like you have to kind of self-disclose and yeah, like well, yeah. Yeah, yeah our only role our only like kind of like responsibility in life is not what we do for a living like you also have your family mm-hmm. and like how your outside life like kind of comes into the therapy yeah. space is very interesting well and it's happened with COVID right our outside oh, life. Yeah. Like, now we're not really blank slates people see into our, our yep. homes now which is really interesting <laughs> So tell me, we, we talked last episode a lot about your personal frameworks on dating. Do, do you use those in your therapeutic session or how do you how do you let those frameworks inform your work with clients that might be struggling with dating? My framework, again, is just like time is limited and just try to enjoy where you are now. So I certainly just try to validate the pain that my clients might be experiencing with um, where they're not here, where they aren't yet, but also identifying their strengths, their progress. Mm -hmm. kind of like how they are filling their time and like really try to have them see kind of like how precious and again limited this time is for Mm -hmm. them like I'm thinking of several clients that I have in their mid-20s like to be able to go out with girlfriends on a Friday and then book a Pilates class the next day and then hang out and then have a lazy day Sunday I'm like heaven (laughs) yeah yeah it's nice and you're probably not going to be able to do that for much longer Mm -hmm. so enjoy Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. I'm trying to I like think of the best way to word my framework. I I feel like I orient towards two things. Like the first being the only responsibility you have to yourself is to like meet your own needs. And like everything after that, all of your wants, like I'm on board. And I say this to clients all the time where I'm I basically say I'm in your corner mm-hmm. all of the time. All the time. As long as you are firm and set and golden in what you're doing and why you're doing it, I don't care what choice you make, I'm on board. Which is very interesting because all of a sudden decisions will start to waver and they're like, am I on board with this? And you're like, I don't know. Like, You tell me and I'll let you know if I'm on board. Yeah, (laughs) because it's, I say to them, like, basically, I show up as me. And that's kind of how I utilize self-disclosure. I think a lot of my reactions or responses or anything like that, like it really is me. And it's obviously shaped by not doing harm, wanting the best for them in their lifestyle and their choices. But it can be really freeing in the therapeutic relationship to say like, I'm with you in this my heart hurts for you or I'm with you in this. And like, I am pumped up. Like that type of really expressive joy and really like genuine emotions, I think can just bring the humanization element into it Mm -hmm. without me ever needing to even share a scenario. So true. Just like I'm in it, you're in it, I'm in it, here we go. And then you add on top of the, the aspect of saying like, Hey, where are you in your life? And are you chill with it? Because if you are, great. We're going to stay in this space. If you're not, also great. 
have some awareness and we'll ride with it. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. big awareness oriented. Yes. You you can't do anything without awareness and building that awareness. We're talking earlier off off camera about attachment theory and attachment style. And Mm -hmm. what we were all sharing was there's a lack of awareness. You know, it's, it's, it's surprising sometimes because we're so in it. It's theories that we learn. It's theories Mm -hmm. that we work with to come across a client that just doesn't understand that and do you both see that in your work with your clients that maybe it's the first time they're hearing it is is from us sometimes i do feel like it's attachment theory is starting to gain more popularity and like mm-hmm. pop psychology and i feel like mm-hmm. a lot of single people a lot of people in their 20s 30s are learning more about this mm-hmm. um but it's it's been kind of like a recent shift i would yeah, say just right, yeah. like the past like five seven years mm-hmm. so i love when clients like know a little bit about it and yeah. i think just having that somewhat of a familiar familiarity with with it, but being excited to learn more about it kind of puts us in a really great position to be able to educate and and have that discussion with them. I mean, I didn't know my attachment theory until I was 29. I like, I just assumed, but I used attachmenttheory.com and like went through and like read the Mm. workbooks about like, what is my style? Yeah. I've like referred many clients to that because I think talking about attachment theory is important to do in session, but also giving clients the space to say like, please learn this on your own in the safe space of where it works for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because there's a hell of a lot of information that's yeah. going to, it's basically like a kaboom moment. You're, yeah. Like, oh, wow. Okay. That all makes sense now. That's yeah. my pattern. This is why this is my pattern. This is how I show up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there can be a massive feeling of shame associated with all of the years of not knowing it. Oh, yeah. Oh. And it's, it's that ricochet, ricochet. Mm-hmm. where you're like, okay, okay it's great. great. I'm glad we know your attachment style now, but we have to sit with those feelings of whether it's shame, whether it's disappointment, whether it's just like, uh, what did I do with that time? Yeah. The The grieving of it, it, basically. Mm -hmm. That I think is probably the most challenging part when it comes to attachment theory, where you're like, okay, I know it now. Yeah. But... yeah. <laughs> well, I think with any label, it can be hard, right? And you want to be, or I, I try to be mindful, like, this is just to help us understand the patterns, understand mm-hmm. the behaviors, understand mm-hmm. where you're getting stuck. This is not to say this is who you are forever, right? And yeah. we always want to be moving towards secure attachment. So being mm-hmm. mindful, I like how you say, like doing it in a safe space, but then also in the therapeutic space where you can say, mm-hmm. okay, this is what it was. This is not what it has to stay. Yeah. Yeah. And having that understands that and understanding allows us to change patterns mm-hmm. and, and behaviors. Yeah. Pure recognition. Just recognize what's going on. The catalyst for change isn't always jumping off the bridge or blowing things up in one shot. Like the catalyst for change really starts with the awareness of saying like, mm-hmm. I'm in this space. Mm-hmm. Here's what's going on. I recognize I'm doing it. And then you start to get really curious about why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And the why, which I think scares a lot of people, it scared me too, because it's kind of like, oh God, what will I unearth? Right. Why can be really fun. Mm -hmm. Like, why do I do this one random thing? Or why do I gravitate towards these certain people? Like, it doesn't have to be a negative aspect. It can be really curious and exciting and playful great great word and i think if you can stay in that framework Mm -hmm. then it's really helpful i think unearth is a good word too because in that moment where you're learning your attachment style learning the why might not be fun Mm -hmm. exactly might be Mm -hmm. born out of something really traumatic or hard Mm -hmm. and i think that's why it's so delicate and doing it Mm -hmm. with a therapist and in a therapeutic space is really important and helpful but when you heal it when you understand it when you work through it and when you start to shift to secu- the way you date will mm-hmm. change tremendously yeah, totally. the way you you know show up and who you like the the awareness in terms of who you see i had one client we did a lot of attachment work and i, I love this i love when this happens she comes back and she's like my avoidant attachment was triggered was activated yeah. like, oh my god i didn't have to say it great 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 she's yeah. like i'm not not going out with him again like so it's really yeah. cool also mm-hmm. to watch them just build that awareness and make different choices and different different choices and changes and it's yeah it's it's awesome yeah. i love when clients, clients come back and tell me they're not going out with someone again <laughs> because <laughs> no because it's a space of empowerment yeah. i'm like that's incredible you're yeah. choosing not to engage in something because it doesn't serve you Whew. yeah and then it gets interesting too because then they'll be like i had a session not too long ago and she labeled it as attachment. I was like, because she didn't want to go out with the guy again. Mm. And she's like, am I being avoidant? I was like, no, he sucks. Don't right. go out with the guy. <laughs> like, that is great. Yeah. That is progress. And so yeah. just 
continue education on, yeah. on the attachment and the choices I think is really important. What would you say, and we, we mentioned fear last last episode, yeah. but sort of some themes you see in, in dating or struggles in dating in, in your clients or mm-hmm. you know even in this, this audience that we're wanting to talk to, the 30-something year old woman that has yeah. sort of not reached the milestones, not have a partner, mm-hmm. maybe want a baby, not have a baby yet. What, what do you see? Sort of what are those sessions like and, and struggles? I think something that's come up a lot lately is just kind of like this theme with men and just how they are. And specifically, like something that I'm noticing is like, and I'm making a very broad generalization, so I want to be sensitive, but if a man isn't content or satisfied with where his career is or what he does mm-hmm. for a living, it makes him have a lot of difficulty to show up in the way to to be successful in a relationship or kind of to give my female clients like what their expectations or what their needs Mm -hmm. are. Thinking of like all the different factors that are contributing to their experience. Like maybe you're not avoidant or or maybe like, maybe you don't have anxious attachment. Maybe this guy is just really focused on getting his job back on on the grounds and Mm -hmm. and he's not responding to you consistently. So of course you're feeling more anxious, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. but I would say that that's something that I'm noticing more lately. Yeah, yeah. Personally and professionally. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked about that last episode too. This needing versus wanting, right? Yeah. We really, mm-hmm. we really want, and we want, we don't need. Especially yeah. if we're in this place yeah. where both of you are, where you feel really good about where you are, and you, yeah. you're meeting your own needs. A friend of mine. This is so many years ago. This might even. This probably definitely before I met Rob. She gave me this Steve Harvey book. I never read the whole thing, but I think it was the first page that described men so linear that like the yeah. career first yeah. and yeah. then they get all the other things where women were like well we'll just do it all at once yeah, yeah. we can do yeah. it all at once yeah. yeah and so they're not ready to do and again an over generalization mm-hmm. but they're not ready to do the next things until mm-hmm. they feel really good and grounded yeah. mm-hmm. in the professional financial piece yeah and, and oftentimes i see clients who women especially who begin to think less of themselves because their career doesn't have the showy title or Mm, they think that they have less motivation than the man, Mm -hmm. even though it's not true. Like they're wildly accomplished. They're very grounded in their careers. They're very successful. But the moment that a partner is introduced who's spending longer nights at the office or has a more demanding job, Mm -hmm. suddenly they're playing second fiddle. Mm. And... Back to your, what was your original question, Beth, about... Just what the trends are seeing yeah. in dating and the struggles, mm-hmm. especially sort of this demographic, the 30-something-year-old. Mm-hmm. The other thing I see is a lot of questioning of fear in their ability to live their lives. The question that I ask is, is the fear in you or on you? If it's in you, like, we can handle that. That's self-doubt. That is a space of, like... Inner critic. Inner critic. 100%. Yeah. Like, we can handle everything that's internal here. But if it's on you, and that's where it's going back to Julie, where it's like, are you getting external messaging? Are you getting stuff from partners that can't show up for you? And is that triggering fears that if he's not bringing this to me, then I won't get it? Mm -hmm. So if he's not bringing the six-figure salary, or if he's not bringing the grounded family life, especially the really like uh, large friend group, it oh, noticed that yeah, 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 big time, tons of tons of clients, and I've experienced this myself. Where they say, "Well, he has friends. I don't have friends, mm-hmm. so I really want a partner who has that like grounded experience because I can't get it." Mm-hmm. Interesting, and it becomes a can't space, and you're mm-hmm. like, "Hmm, did you have the insecurity before he arrived?" Mm-hmm. The answer is no. Then what are we doing? Yeah. Because that's a whole different dynamic that you can't control. Yeah. Esther Perel speaks about just like these generational shifts in dating and how like maybe like our parents or our grandparents viewed partnership and children as like a cornerstone Mm. event. Like, Mm. okay, we might not have it all right now, but we're going to like turn this corner together and we're going to work towards like achieving these things together. It's okay that we're not exactly where we want to be in our careers or we're not financially as secure as we'd like to be, but we can do it together. Mm -hmm. And now I think, especially in New York, like we view it, she says, as a capstone event. Like we say like, okay, we have have to have the friends, we have to have the finances, we have to have the career, and then we'll we'll be ready. And it takes time. And I think just like people might be at just different 
phases or, mm-hmm. or different places with kind of like wherever they are with their capstone event. And again, that's the olive quote, you know, a yeah. lot of it boils down to luck and timing and, and just like who you come across and where they're at. Yeah. Instantly makes me think of my parents who got married at like 22, 23 mm-hmm. years old and now yeah. been married for like close to 50 years. They always tell the story of their first apartment. And my dad's like, we had one lamp and we had a <laughs> mattress on the floor and yeah. really this like building it yeah. together kind of yeah. idea. And I do think that's definitely shifted. Yeah. 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 I definitely think that's shifted. Yeah. That makes me think we talked about this in our group supervision on Monday about this idea of sparks. And I think oh, yes. Logan Yuri. Yep. What yep. is the yeah. book? Don't die alone. How or... to not die alone. This woman, <laughs> Logan Yuri, I think she's um, like a behavioral scientist. I think she's worked at Google and now I think she works at Hinge mm-hmm. and she just has all of these like kind of like terminologies and like bus dating myths. It's it's a good resource if anyone wants to check it out. Yeah, I think that's one thing. The sparks piece really sparked me, but um, mm-hmm. that my clients always look for that on their first mm-hmm. or second yeah. dates. And like there was no spark. And yeah. I was like, Okay, let's maybe look at that and say, maybe the spark is the red flag, mm-hmm. right? And what is so wrong with a slow build? And I think mm-hmm. there's, we live in a society of instant gratification, Yeah. right? There is no delayed gratification anymore. And we want to know right away. Yeah. And we don't, we don't give it longevity. We won't give it time for this person to reveal it's mm-hmm. themselves. The other thing we had talked about is fear and how fear in, yeah. in, impacts and in, 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 how we show up, right? Mm-hmm. So we're afraid, we're nervous, like yeah. we want this person to like us, mm-hmm. etc. And I think we don't show our true selves probably till, I don't know, date four, date five, yeah. date six. Yeah, several dates in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it takes time. So that's something I talk to my clients about, like as long as you like are somewhat interested, you had a good time, like just try to see Go them again. again. Yes. Yeah, just yes. try, like, of course, like you want to, there, you want there to be some attraction or some level of interest, but like don't expect it to be love at first sight or like mm-hmm. fireworks immediately on the first date. I, you know, just this like being the cheerleader in the corner yeah. for our clients. Like I was so, you know, just being mindful. Like I want them to succeed. I want them to yeah. meet. And so yeah. it's like, come on, just go again. You yeah. know, it's, not, it's not what I'm saying in session, but I really, I want them to stay open to that. I want yeah. them to sort of move past this idea that it has to be sparks or it's going to mm-hmm. be instantaneous. And, you know, I don't think that happens. Like that did not happen in my yeah. relationship with Rob. I thought he was like boring as can be. I was <laughs> very, very wrong. But I was in this grounded place and it allowed me to stay patient, it allowed me to be yeah. myself and it allowed me to see him for who he really was. Because if I went by date one or read two, I'd be like, this guy's not it. Like, yeah. so I really, I think it's important and I, I try to encourage like you do, my clients to stay in it a little bit, unless there is something blaringly wrong, you feel yeah. unsafe, you feel uncomfortable, yeah. Yeah. for sure, don't go out again. But. Yeah. If you're kind of like, it was okay. I was like, great. Second date. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. Well, I always kind of ask them like, where did you feel it? Because where's the spark? If it's in your like belly, like right behind your belly button, chances are that's you being you and you're really excited to see that person against mm-hmm. you. If it's in your head, if it's the thought process, if it becomes, and I don't mean like, oh, you made it up. I mean like if your thoughts are flying towards, I felt this spark. I really want to maintain it. I really want to keep it alive. I really... If you're in this neck up space, you're like real out of your own energy because that's the space where you say, that's the orientation where you go, okay, what parts of me do I need to show so they come back? Mm -hmm. When you're in like a neck down space, it's, well, I'm me and it seems like I lit up a little bit around you. That's nice. Mm -hmm. But I also light up in other areas. So... Cool. Well, I think the leading with the head sometimes too, and I, a lot of clients and even myself way back in my single dates, this idealization of like, I'm not seeing who's actually sitting in front of me. I'm like making up who's in front of me because my, in my mind, I want them to be this person and I'll overlook everything that doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, meet that mm-hmm. version of this person I want them to be. And that's so, can be so highly, highly disappointing. I think a good date is where you lose nothing. You, mm. you like show up as yourself and you leave as yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But you haven't lost anything. Mm-hmm. And like that's a phenomenal space to be in. You get to show up as you. You're leaving with you. Damn. Yeah. A bad date takes. Mm-hmm. Or a, an overly charismatic or an overly narcissistic person. Ooh. They take. Ooh, they and, take. They and you take. feel less than. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you're leaving a date feeling less than, chances are that's not a space that's going to be beneficial for you to operate in. Yeah, I feel so proud of my clients that continue to show up on their dates and continue to 
really understand and bring that awareness and sort of reflect on those dates. Good date, bad date, yeah. felt something, felt this. And then they take that information and go back in to yeah. the dating yeah. world. And I, I really love that. And I do think fear informs. I think attachment style informs. I think family origin, you know, it's a whole nother topic, informs and sort of understanding that, healing those parts and then continuing to go out into the world. and. I give everybody total validation for being in therapy because yeah. it's a great space, but it can be a hard space. And so for those women or men that come in and show up and understand their patterns and bring awareness and go back and make it a better date, I think is yeah. so amazing. And I feel so honored to be on that journey yeah. with people. Yeah. I love their courage. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Just, yeah. I love reminding my clients too, like if they go through a breakup or if they decide to not see someone again, like it's a common thought process to be like, well, I'm back at square one or mm -hmm. I have to start all mm -hmm. over again. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, you're, you're starting new with the information that you learned mm -hmm. from our sessions, from this relationship, like you're moving forward with more clarity yeah. and that's such a great place to be. Yeah. And yeah. that helps to kind of like switch maybe like the mm -hmm. feelings of hopelessness to then more hope and more kind of like confidence in, in where they're going. Yeah, not even just the back, I guess like the lines, this wasting time, like you didn't waste time. You've yeah. learned something new. You've you learned invested. Something. Yeah, you've invested. You've learned something about yourself. You learned something about, you know, something you might not have known you wanted or needing in a partner. And like, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, like bringing pieces back to you. And I, when I was dating, it was like, oh, I like that. And this one, I like this, like yeah. I kind of put it together. Like who, mm -hmm. who is this person? What do they have to encompass and value and be? And so mm -hmm. the learning and the awareness is so, is so huge. Well, thank you both for joining again, incredible women and incredible therapists. If anyone ever wants to work with Julie or Lauren, you can find us and them at NYC Therapeutic Wellness. They are in Incredible, incredible. Let them help you understand your attachment. <laughs> yes. We would Thank love you to. Both. Thanks, Beth. Thank you both for being here. Of course.